Olá, bom dia a todos, todas e todes. Meu nome é Tarsila Fidalgo, eu sou coordenadora do projeto Termo Territorial Coletivo na ONG Comunidades Catalisadoras e hoje nós vamos conversar sobre novos caminhos para a construção de cidades sustentáveis, o potencial da gestão coletiva da terra a partir do Termo Territorial Coletivo ou Community Land Trust. Nosso evento vai ser uh, traduzido tanto para o espanhol quanto para o inglês. Uh, o processo de tradução vai ser feito por alunas do curso de formação de intérpretes da PUC-Rio. Uh, então, vou dar aqui uma breve explicação sobre como todos, todas e todes podem acessar o canal de tradução simultânea do Zoom. Uh, para ativar a tradução, clique no ícone do globo no painel de controle do Zoom e selecione o seu idioma de preferência. Uh, for the English speaking people to activate the translation, please click on the globe icon in the Zoom control panel and select your preferred language. Uh, para las personas que hablan español, uh, para activar la traducción, haga un clic en el icono del globo terráqueo en el panel de control de Zoom y seleccione su idioma preferido. Uh, feitas Feita a seleção da tradução, vamos começar nossa live. A ideia aqui é que a gente tenha um debate internacional sobre o potencial do termo territorial coletivo a partir da dimensão da gestão coletiva proporcionada pelo modelo como uma alternativa, por el modelo, como uma alternativa. e uma ferramenta para a implementação do da... com o objetivo de... de 11 cidades sustentáveis. Nós vamos começar uh, com uma breve apresentação sobre o termo territorial coletivo para todos, todas e todes que nos escutam e que ainda não conhecem o modelo. Depois nós vamos passar para uma mesa redonda sobre a importância da gestão coletiva da terra e da mobilização comunitária para o alcance uh, do objetivo do desenvolvimento sustentável 11 em assentamentos informais a partir do arranjo do Community Land Trust, ou termo territorial coletivo. E, no final, nós vamos ter uma mais discussão about the leaderships and residents on the informal settlements facing the, the, the tools that they have in this sustainable cities. And also we have, we have an opening chat. So let's get started. I'm going to present about the CLT, which is the Community Land Trust. Let me share my screen with you. Just one second, please. Okay, let's do it. So we're going to start with this brief presentation about the Community Land Trust so that if anyone doesn't know about it, you, we can talk more about that. So the community land trust is a new instrument to ensure tenure, a formalization of land tenure. So what is important to know, it is that the CLT has had more than 50 years of history. So it's not a new model, even though it's new recently here in Brazil, but it has started in the civil rights movements in the, the US through a popul uh, population initiative. And it has spread firstly through the whole US and then to the world in the last decades. So what is the CLT? 
it is a, a, a model of community land trust proper to Brazilian specificities, especially to the, through a legal aspects. So the CLT is our land trust, our community land trust, and it has an idea of an agreement between the people and the, the community. And in Brazil, just like other countries in the world, intends to ensure security of, of land through the, a model of land and the buildings, and as well with mobility community. So in a very uh, uh, picturing that, the CLT is what you have here on the screen. It is the community land rights for the community in, as a whole, and it's going to be managed by the, the residents. It is individual to each family and each resident. And that, that means that it's a, a stronger housing right. And why is that? A legal entity who has the, the land cannot sell this land. It's going to not, it's not going to be on the market in the real estate market. They're not going to be accessible. Even though that the, the people can change and share them between the, the residents itself, but they not, cannot uh, change the land or sell the land. They can do that for the housing. So that ensures that the residents can enjoy their lands without having a rise in their in their pricing especially because there are so many marginalized and more vulnerable residents there so it's a tool that has been helping all the people that has been living there especially in those communities and that want to start this, this enterprise. So the CLT has five basic features. It's very flexible. It has a lot of freedom between the groups to decide their own rules, but they have five main features that they need to be present, present so that the experience is it can be classified as a CLT. So the first is the collective land property. It is a legal entity that is going to have uh, the right to administrate and manage for their, their residents. So the people who's going to live there are going to have freedom in order to to have them to have all the housings maybe to give them as inheritance to their children so that responds to that legal rights that they have the second it is a membership spontaneous membership the participants should opt to be part of it, accepting their goals and, and rules. And why is that important? Because it's important that the residents are united and they have an active voice and a, a continuous mobilizing. They need to believe in that model. Otherwise, they're only, it's only going to be an arrangement and it's only going to be as a bureaucracy and it's not going to work. And the spontaneous membership means that the CLT is not to be imposed to any groups. So it's not, a, it's not about any person just coming and saying, you know, 
now you're going to be a CLT. That, that cannot happen. That must not happen. That, that's not an option. We want to make clear that we need to have unanimity in order to form and develop a, a CLT. And the, even the residents, they don't need to be, they don't need to be neighbors, but even for that matter, it means that they are a community as well. Another characteristic feature, it is about community control. And that is because the residents have the, the property of the land. And they can also uh, manage the land and the community development. So they have a board and people that are going to work with their your collective ideals and purposes, but we also have different different meetings that they are the residents are summoned and they can have they are wielded uh, an active voice for them. And the last feature of the CLT, which is the main one, it is the economical accessibility. the permanent affordability. We are used, unfortunately, to see many processes that some residents and which are vulnerable socially. And when this land is gets better, they have better structure. Usually their lands, they rise and the vulnerable population that has been working on that, sometimes they don't have the possibility to enjoy their, their lands and what they have been building. So in that way, they have, they have a permanent uh, accessibility to that place. So whenever anybody else comes to that, and especially the population who has been living there for decades can also enjoy that development. The CLT is a model that is so spread in the world that and it is so well, has been so successful to guarantee the, the permanence of residents and also to promote the development of the community. Uh, having the community as protagonists themselves, that it was included in the new urban agenda, uh, a pact that was firmed in 2016 by the UN member countries. And it brings its item um, 107 as the, C the CLT as a model to be stimulated by the states, by the member states in in seeking the permanence and the, the community development of these vulnerable communities. So how does it work? How do we implement it in Brazil? Each country has its different model. In Brazil, we have this model that is drawn a little bit like this, as you can see. So in every place, the first uh, break that needs to be put is the community mobil mobilization over the CLT. Uh, and then we have the par some parallel movements. And on one side, we have the formalization of land rights. So we consolidate the land rights in that area in the name of the community. And while this process is happening, in the, the land rights side, we start creating the structures needed to implement the CLT. And what are these structures? Here in Brazil, we have the creation of uh, uh, what we call a judicial person, which is an organization that has the land ownership, the creation of bylaws for that area so that the, the residents can have clear rules for living and relationships and also the use of that land. And also when we consolidate the land, land ownership and the, okay. the land is given to the organization, we have the separation between the ownership of land and buildings. Uh, 
utilizing in here in Brazil as well as in Puerto Rico. And we're going to hear a little bit about there, about what happened there. We use the surface rights, which is a real sort of right. And it's something that has been uh, applied in Brazil for the last 20 years. So we create this whole structure for the CLT in Brazil. And then we talked a little, we talked a lot, and we're going to talk about how this is applied in informal settlements, especially in favelas and communities. But the CLT, it can also be applied in new, um, in new living areas. So this is another alternative that can also be uh, a good option for new groups that are beginning this new, um, this new idea. So what are the gains that the CLT bring? Thinking about the Brazilian scenario, we have a long, long standing scenario of informal settlements. And in our territory, we have a vast uh, number of these sorts of settlements. We have over a thousand favelas, which is one of the, the informal settlements. And it's, uh, it's very real in Brazil, not only in Rio. And how does it apply to reality? So the CLT tends to the, the first worry of the residents, which is the need to be to have the security of staying in one place. And that's why uh, most residents of these informal settlements want to have the land ownership. And the CLT does uh, cater to this need, as well as the same time that it guarantees um, a development of the community. The CLT also maintains the public investment uh, in to directed to the the target audience, so it avoids the 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 drying of ice with a paper towel effect, in which the the mayor invests in a certain area to improve that area to get bring a certain infrastructure, and then the prices rise a lot, and then the population needs to move to a further location because they cannot stay there and in that place you need more investments and you have this this drying of ice with paper towel effect and this is something that we want to avoid also the CAT, clt maintains what has has been a, a very affordable housing market in brazil with which are the informal settlements which i voice the the the, the, the speculative market from getting into these places. But it also encourages the communities to continue the self-management processes. The informal settlement, settlements are usually uh, characterized by self-management, not because the, the residents chose it, but because they need to make do to be able to survive in that land and to improve the place where they are and to guarantee the minimal conditions for them to leave. So the process of self-management in the CLT is encouraged, not only as something that needs to be done in a, in a terrible situation, but, all, but as a way of controlling their own development and, and empowering the, the residents with the, the, the help of the organization of the CLT. Here in Brazil, as for those who don't know, we have a project uh, uh, of what we call the Favela CLT project. And we've been working to bring the model to the country since 2018 and to implement it in, we have a few pilot communities here in Rio. I brought a little sum up of our activities of our last two years. 2021 and 2022. 2021 still in the pandemic, but we started to spread the idea of the CLT through the country. We also had a public audience um, 
in the municipal chamber trying to include the term CLT in the, the, the municipal plans in Brazil. So we are also in trying to get this plan to be part of the, the Rio de Janeiro's plans. Uh, we, be, we believe this is incredibly important to us. Now in 2022, with the pandemic in a better situation, we return our, our in-person activities. We've had a, a series of events with the specialists, international specialists throughout the year. We included the CLT in the directive plan in Rio. So it was the first time in Brazil that included this term. We have an Instagram for the project. We have the World Forum in, Pol in Poland, and we introduced our experience. And we also had the CLT included in the platform of social movements in in Brazil and in Rio. So our project has been going forward and it is a pleasure to be part of this urban circuit and to bring these advancements to the project and to be able to discuss them with our supporters, with our residents, with our partners, and also with all of you who are listening to us right now. I would just like to end by bringing some um, to recognize of recognizing a few things. So it was included in the law project in Rio de Janeiro in the direct directive plan for the city of Rio and Maringá. It was also included in the debates on the revision of housing in Belo Horizonte in the state of Minas Gerais, also in some other cities such as Curitiba. From 2018, we've had over 30 uh, academic papers on the theme. So it shows the enthusiasm on the model, but also how legitimate it became in the, the, the academia and also in the public debate. And we also have it being brought up in the public debate, both by, by social movements and also civil societies. So if you want to know more, we have our website, www.territorialcoletivo.org. I invite all of our audience to visit us. You can see our material, our path so far. And without further ado, let me just try. I cannot stop sharing my screen. There you go. Well, without further ado, let's give the word to our guests to hear a little bit about from them. And we're going to start talking about the importance of collective managed of land and uh, community mobilizing for the achievement of sustainable cities in informal set settlements through the organization of the CLT. We're going to have four guests in our table to talk about their experiences in different places of the world, a gathering of experiences from tra trajectories dedicated to this theme, both in CLTs, also in other projects for uh, community management of, of land. And I would like to start by, uh, by calling Teresa Williamson. She is a doctor in urban 
planner planning by the University of Pennsylvania and also the co the founder and executive director of catalytic communities which um, coordinates the CLT. Teresa, thank you for your time here and you have the floor. Thank you, Tarsila. It's great to listen about that. And now I'm going to talk about Puerto Rico's experiences. So I'm going to follow that, what Tarsila has talked about the, uh, the CLT in Brazilian land. Now we're going to add more ab about the Puerto Rico. I'd like to thank everyone to be here. It's great to have these members and I believe that this exchange of ideas is going to be great and everybody is going to, to talk now. It is great to listen about every, all the experience that you have in other lengths as well. And let me talk and uh, show you some images that I have. What I'm going to show you today, it's about, it's about some discuss, discussions that we have about why it is necessary to invest in this management tool, such as the CLT in the favelas of Brazil. I'll go, I'm not going to talk much about the CLT because the other speakers are also going to to show that and give a lot of evidence about it. And everything that you also would like to know more of, you can see on the link that you have on, on the screen, because I'm going to go through very, very briefly about the, uh, the CLTs here. So let me talk about my approach, our approach here. The, on the TTC model, the CLT model. I believe it's important to highlight that the CLT is all about what the communities have reached and achieved so far. And also the importance of keeping the quality of these favelas and communities especially because of the, co of the collectiveness that they have built there. So all these realizations that they have had in the favelas, which is the urban structure, everyone knows it's very hard to plan. So let me talk about the communities and what is our point of view on the importance of the CLT. So we have started 22 years ago in the favelas of Rio. And in our work, we want to have uh, support of the favelas through the leaders and centered into the residents and their lands. As you're going to see in, on the pictures, we have always worked collectively. We want to support everyone who has been working on the favelas uh, with the collective people. So it's been 22 years of close work in having these elements that has been working and featured in the favelas. So you can see in this diagram, the light part in this in the circle, it, uh, the blue one, it's a part of a, a, a three part of activities. We have a community uh, communication of the people that is a, in a way to work the narrative of the favelas because there is a very negative point of view of the favelas and that has hindered all the works that we have been trying to, to do in green you see a sustainable favela network which is hundreds of local leaderships that have been leaders who have been working a lot on sustainability and social environmental technologies and exchanges 
And we also have the collective lands because you, you know that the favelas have been developing the the oldest favela in Rio is going to turn to celebrate its 125th years in Rio. So it's uh, generational. The, the favelas are generational. They have going through generations. And what if the government is going to invest on the, those favelas? So it's there is a risk that this collective groups are going to be disseminated, uh, dissipated and are not going to work on the interests of these groups. So we want to, to have and search for, for com to have communities that are sustainable. And that's why we have the trees here in this in this picture, there's no way that we can have that we build a, a sustainable a tree, a sustainable work on that without having a, a, a community that is well centered. So some, some of the principles that we have which are keys of the CLTs is granting channels of communication with the government. We see that there is this narrative which is key in order to the management of the lands. So you, we are able to have an idea of the, the work of the CLTs and you see that it is very collective. So speaking a little bit more about our approach, it is, we work with the community development, which is in the right that you can see on the screen. That is very differently different from the way that the government, the government see, sees the, the favelas. So very quickly, because I know that you, you all know that favela, you, should, you probably know more about the favelas and the, the people who is, who is there. But briefly, it, uh, the favelas are not in a negative way. We're not going to speak about that on that matter. Well, now I'm going to show you some pictures of Rio and that it has a, a basic information that it has to be recognized about the favelas and the racial injustice. And unfortunately, we have seen a lot of racism and many lands that haven't been invested the, gov the government hasn't been investing on those lands, on the favelas, and they sometimes we, many things that have cultural, uh, we have many cultural events such as the samba, the passinho, and we, that they bring, they are, they have started in the favelas. And we have seen that the public resources haven't been reaching there the way they have they were supposed to. But the cultural exchange and the social exchange, it's great, it's huge, and it, it, you can't deny that it, it happens there. So we have two different ways of life, we could, if we could say that. We see a kind of a, a pavimentation a reasoning, which is, uh, the way that they are have been working, that they're going to well, let's let let's formalize the favelas, as if it was not formalized. Or you see that, and the other one is the informality of the favelas, so just as if there were two ideas of it, and actually there are two lifestyles that are so different. And it's important to highlight all the qualities that the favela brings. 
and all the resonance brings to it so that we can highlight all them all of them there is a video on youtube that has been uh, aired 10 years ago said because the government was going to give some titling to her and she said that she didn't want any titling because she said that she would have less security and the speculative market would come to her and she said that she wanted to have formalization without having the affordability housing of houses that she they have And here there is a Maslow pyramid, and I believe that this is not a Maslow pyramid. He was not a, he was a psychologist that has been dissipated, disseminated about this, uh, his psychologist, and he's going, he has talking about the, the ship metaphor. And you see that there is this concept of the, this boat as a necessity, as you can see here in, in this image. But despite the community, it's only one element. Actually, the community gives a, a strong community uh, can meet many needs of the, the community. So I believe that the CLT is one of uh, one of the qualities that besides housing that, of course, we think about housing that is the most important, but actually the, sometimes we might think that community is not as important, but I think that it is having a better house, a better housing, uh, when we have all of these working together, we have a better uh, life quality of life. So what are the alternatives in the world nowadays? In Los Angeles, there are many ho homeless people that have been living on the streets. There's in the favelas, you see that they, they have many community centers that need to be preserved. I was going to speak a bit more but i don't want to i don't want to have the time that of my other uh, speak of the other speakers so i'm going to give to hand the floor to the other people that have and uh, ahead of us and i'm going to talk about the community matters it's a book about the the importance of the model of the CLTs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Teresa, for your what you have told us. Now I'm going to talk about Livia. Livia has participated in in the, PP, the PTC of Puerto Rico, and now Livia is the co-founder of the NGO Ellen Hambre. And she's going to talk a bit more about this, those initiatives and also about how big it has been the community. Livia, you have the floor. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be here with our partners. I'm going to share with you now and what I'm going to share with you is comes from practice and what I have seen about regularization of the land in Puerto Rico. Just as some discussions in other contexts as well. Other speakers are going speakers are going to talk a bit more about that, but the CLT is more about values to formalize the lands and this is in many dimensions this works in many dimensions 
As the titling has been fragmented into the state, it means that sometimes it's important for, for the housing and and the, the another objective that we have, another goal in that maybe is the most important one is to avoid the eviction of uh, an intervention in a context as in Puerto Rico. Well, we have um, individual titling pushing for something different is a great challenge. Not only when thinking of dealing with external actors such as the state, but also within the community. The challenges of management and that, that don't quite exist in other COTs. In the North, many organizations um, acquire empty land and develop them to get them out of the market and to develop housing, to rent them in affordable prices. And it works usually in the context of a community that is suffering pressure from the, the, the real estate market and that allows people to stay in the housing unities with without being uh, under the threat of being moved by other policies. So this structure, this financing structure uh, resulted in the loss of housing. Thinking about the, the, the this housing, the, the real estate changes the housings became, after a period, the houses became available for other uses. So this is one of the main goals and it's one of the ways that we operate with the CLTs. The experiences with some of these models with communities that face the, the eviction problem is that the, the option that is offered not necessarily via, intends to protect the community. So you have some CLTs with uh, empty houses or the number of houses available are not enough for the community or the prices of resale and amongst many other things. Uh, in cases as the channel, which the idea is to uh, formalize the land, we have a context in which the community is already in the land, which is the object of the creation of the CLT. In cases such as Puerto Rico, many residents have the expectation to have an individual uh, land ownership because that's how we have been working the idea of formalizing land for a very long time and uh, we can do that by many uses in many forms also some governmental uh, ideas and the success of formalizing the CLT depends on the community choosing this model in a voluntary manner. In the case of the channel, um, the choice for the ownership happened in a bigger context in which people, we had a discussion of ownership, not only individually, but in a collective manner and seeing it as a tool to achieve the community's aspiration, not only with a, as an end in itself. And so the population exposed themselves to other forms of possession and why they wanted to formalize the possession of land and why they chose that manner, thinking about their collective and individual criteria that demanded an effort of 
investments and resources, dialogue and follow-ups and involvement of all the community sectors in a way that, in a way to win over the prejudices on about this manner of uh, land ownership. So the work began in the base and then we formalized the strategy from the state to the state and then from the state to the community. And in the process, we, we identified some key ingredients that might happen in other places that allowed the communities to consider the collective ownership. Some of them are consolidated settlements in which the, the, the residents are afraid of moving. Places where people don't have the land ownership and you're looking for some way to have access to the land. Also the sense of belonging and the, desire, the, the will to stay and also process of processes of community organization that offer these terms. Later in a collective management process, as we dealt with the, the legal processes of the farms, we also had a process, a, a community process of to, to choose how to manage the land. And this is important because the communities are not monolithical. You have different uh, groups of people and, and owners of land structure, the, the renters, and many others. And even still, in the case of Puerto Rico, the first community to chose the collective land management without having other uh, references brought many challenges. On the other hand, when the collective land management was created, present some features that are key for the long-term success. So the idea is the main goal is perpetuity. So we need to think about this from the beginning, from the get-go, how are the leaders going to behave and how is the community able is the community able to adapt to these changes so these are lessons from other commun uh, communities so such as the the palo alto cooperatives in mexico and also the decisions in other places that left the the collective land management for other types of land ownerships that we saw in puerto rico and mexico in the channels case, different from the others, it began already very big. It covered a huge plot of land and the, the, the community management and the trans, transparency were key for the management. Especially examples such as Puerto Rico, the complexities in the development of housing, the investment in other sectors of infrastructure, but also the community management is important for the day-to-day -day life, for it to make sense for them to be beyond just a part, not beyond just a paper. People need to be there. Uh, you need to bring uh, meaning to the sense of community, the sense of collective, to have assemblies, annual assemblies, to approve uh, budgets. In the, the plan for the channel, we took a task that it usually belongs to the state, which is this, the giving of surface rights, which the state usually does in individual rights. the individual interest to have, have something to give to, to children. Mario will explain it better. But what I wanted to say is that the CLT operates in the legal 
context that hasn't changed and hasn't adapted to this figure, which means that working each individual ownership can bring challenges such as succession um, and also dealing with situations, with family situations. The connection of what the collective management uh, entails and also what the individual rights to possession entail. Even still, they benefit from the collective land management as it happened already. So for us to, to, to make these fights more feasible, in the channel, we forged alliances with other sectors that allow the success that we have been having so far. And finally, uh, a strong community management helps us deal with the challenges that appear throughout the way. The, the tries, the attempts against the, the COT or the challenges of the adaptation to the climate changes. The COT as a tool of formalization, are a, they are a tool and not an end in themselves. They can be simple or complex depending on their goals, but the long-term success is connected to the organizational work, the continuous organizational work of the communities. And that requires sometimes activism, uh, professional follow up to continue the, the processes and also for the, com the community to define what is it that they want, how do they want it and what kind of property rights adjust to their needs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Divya, for your speech and your presentation and your work that is so inspiring for all of us. I'm going to call Juan Blanco now. He is environmental manager engaged with sustainable urban planning and, and agroecology, also a cultural producer and writer who dedicated part of his path to the building of the San Francisco community path. Obrigado, obrigado, gente. So one, thank you for your for gente, being here with us. Relevante, com, é, thank you, thank you for being here with so many important people and to bring my experience with the COTs. It is an older experience. I've been in San Francisco. I lived in, in the States in two different times from 94 to 96 and, and then from 2001 to 2010. And while I was in San Francisco, I was involved with the homeless organizations and people with very bad living situations. So I have a little presentation to show here, but I'm going to go a little bit faster because this one that I presented the last time, it would take way too long, but I want to give an idea of how the COT in San Francisco came up, how it appeared, and how it could be applied in places such as Sao Paulo. Well, San Francisco is the city that we all know, that we all see around. It is, it has about 875,000 inhabitants. 10% of the population below the poverty line. In 2019, 8,000 people were living in the streets. And for you to have a comparison, we have 12,000. We have 20, 12 million people in Sao Paulo and 42,000 in the streets. If São Paulo were to have the amount of people in the streets at São Francisco, it would be about three times that number. So this is a scene of San Francisco that you don't really see in the movies. I think it's important that we understand 
that it is impossible to live in this city. And we can see how, how important is the CLT. Every community that you find a, a situation of an eternal conflict about of those who have a lot and those who don't have almost anything. And those who have almost nothing develop themselves. These communities develop themselves and they develop their means of management. And what happens is when we uh, manage to modify these situations, one of the first things that happen is the disorganizing of these collective management. And that favors the, the, the economical power. So in San Francisco, we they have started studying about housing and what was the typical immigrant living and housing. So in this case, they were mostly Asian and that was mostly hotels that were, co were converted into rooms. And that's a whole family that lives in this space that you can see. And at these conditions, you can see that besides creating so much difficulty and hardships because they don't have stability and they are always subjected to so much pressure of the, the, the owners. So we started to build a series of, uh, of, of uh, events and groups to work with the, the CLT and in in San Francisco, it's a mo it's mostly about uh, in, in, they work in a vertical way in buildings. So if you know the favelas in in Brazil, which are mostly the mostly houses, okay, maybe they would may have one or two floors, but they're not so so big comparing to San Francisco, and in São Paulo and San Francisco, which I know a lot, which I know better. They have a more similar. Uh, they have more si similar buildings. They are mostly downtown, and they are occupied uh, uh, buildings, and they were taken over, and they were in a very a poor situation. So, in this case, there were more than twenty-one apartments in that. A building it was a private uh, building it was rented by a person so it was a it was something that was always about bringing money to the person so we we wanted to work with an organization in Chinatown and uh, because of the all the debts that these buildings have had, had uh, in and for the city, that's why they weren't supposed to, to be working in a formal way. So that's why they're in, in accordance to the city hall, the the occupants started to to go and live there, to go there. And they I'm sorry, there's a minor problem here. Well, this building is on the property of the land trust. So what I believe that it's important to understand here is that it can be a land trust, just as the case in San Francisco. And they have so many buildings scattered around the city. They were occupied in, in a way that they were uh, once um, they were once uh, on rent for other people, and because of of the of some debts that they were they were disoccupied. So one, the San Francisco Land Trust takes over that that place. They have a community of of that that building, and. Each one of these unities and buildings and housings, they have, they set a board of, and they are going to, to give all the guidelines of the groups and 
but in the housings, they are going to regulate themselves and organize as a community of the land trust in the society. There are 12 uh, community land trusts, uh, 12 housings uh, and buildings in San Francisco nowadays. And and having and I, I believe that one of the most important lands here that uh, and things that we could do in a land that they have so so much so many needs it's exactly that that we have a place that maybe once they wouldn't have sanitation and in sometimes in the the buildings if you get in if you do some improvements for the the people who are living there they're going to sometimes they're going to they're having the need to sell something and going somewhere else so it's important to understand and create alternatives in, in very dense urban uh, centers where there's so much so many differences and it's great to see that we have this collective management so that we we can settle and have individualization of the people and they have their their rights to have to property and there is a reason for that because the individual power of the people that have less, that are poorest, is usually less than the other people who have more in, in at their hands. And the only way that the poor people have is in to to work on that is by uniting themselves. And that's the favela has survived in Rio, for example, for 125 years, exactly because they have had informal management tools, and but they were working together, and that's what granted their survival. So in K in cities just like São Paulo, in if you transform and and in the their the lands. Uh, they, sometimes they're going to go for, they're not going to go for noble uh, or if we could call if we could call that noble lens so it is a learning curve it's a, an, a collective one in in a way that we whenever you have this process that we have uh, a way that we can collectively think of cooperative ways and we can relearn in a certain way because we sometimes we forget that we live in a community and because that has been replaced by, by a different logic and reasoning that I have to go on over what's mine and people really don't, don't know sometimes how we work on 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 these matters so in this this restores the 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 power of sharing and the collective power in order to so that we can solve the the needs and the problems that we might have i know that we are running out of time and i want to respect that but I want, just want to have this this uh, discussion later if we have time on the on the questions and answers. But this is what I have to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. That was very great to listen to you. Now I'm going to talk uh, to call the last speaker that we have. It it is a. Uh, Professor Yves Cabanes, he works at the University College London and participant of Mutiro 50, a first 
uh, a plenary experience in Brazil, and I believe that many, many of the people that are listening to us don't know it, and we'll have the pleasure to know it. And we're having an, an article on Real Watch about this. So, Eves, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good, good afternoon, everyone. I'll try to, to tell you about an experience of a time that I was part of uh, social movements in Fortaleza from the, the housing movement. Uh, I'm, and I'm going to share with you I'm going to share my presentation so that you can see a bit more of it. Can you see here? Yes, Juan, it's great. Okay. So let me show you in 10 minutes a summary of 10 years of work. And yeah, it's very hard. In 1986, which was a, move, a, a movement that we had, and we have had contact with a homeless movement in the outs on the outskirts, and from that we have a different government of the the Workers' Party, and. And they, we were asked by them to develop a, an experience of a popular housing. And we started the Muchiro, which is the Brazilian way of, of housing to help it and also to help each other. And it, from 87 to 88, it was the first experience it, there were the first experiences that we had on the Fortaleza City Hall. And the Rondon Council. And they had so many evictions at that time in the, in the also before dictatorship and, and also in the favelas. In 1989, there was a crisis because they of a different government. And as Ciro Gomes was elected, he was going for support and trying to develop better, better housings as well. So they started and the first 43 housings, but the families didn't know exactly where they would go. So first they needed a collective study and later they would have the opportunity to, to choose what they would, where they would go. So it is interesting that in 1990, there was there was uh, 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 the beginning of of that, and we wanted to regularize that. And we were working with people that were migrating. And after that, I see that it's that all the poverty was was big and. We were working with these people, and I believe that, mo for example, different. There were different. It, it was a bit different from what we have seen before, and we were very challenged to to work uh, with these people that were in suffering hunger as well. 
in the center of movement, I want to speak a little bit more. Um, the property was a typical land trust and the housing territories were given by a contract with a real contract of use concession for each family. So the housing was property after about six years that they paid for the building material, the construction material. And the rest of the, the, the land was part, stayed under the, the responsibility of the compo. And we also got together with the social movements. In Fortaleza, we had a school that worked relatively well, and it was a movement to have a project with the, C the Fortaleza City Hall to improve the houses, to have mutual guarantees. It's another innovation that we learned. And in 1996, we had a circle saying that it was given a prize in Istanbul as the first collective property experience when we got a prize in Istanbul by the UN of the best practices. I would just like to bring back some elements that I believe are incredible to be part of a group like this, because a lot of what I'm going to say, I already heard from each one of you. So I'm just going to bring some more elements. I just want to remind you where Fortaleza is, because I don't know who's here with us, but um, but it's in Brazil, in the state of Ceará. The Mutirão 50 was made by a lot of people, fishermen that were thrown 50 kilometers from their area. And it will become pilot for a program called Comunidade, which was also given a prize. And it became a pilot for many other experiences, but I'm not going to talk about them because I don't have time. But it was a change of scale to a thousand houses as we see, saw in many places in Fortaleza in which the land was cheaper. So this was the place, 1.3 kilometers, a uh, uh, trash deposit, it, was, it would flood, but it was what we managed to get by the city hall. So you can see the type of cat, the housing that was the reality of these people. Um, and we decided to come from the basis inspired by the Uruguayan cooperatives in which we have a good relationship. We talked about Palo Alto, Mexico as well, we went through this. These were inspirations as well with the, the, the task, for, task forces that happen in other places. Uh, something that happened, for example, in India. Um, and lastly, and they're not as selective as the Americans, but they, they were the Letchworth and the, Cidade, the Jardim cities, um, which is the eldest experience that we have. It has 120 years of age, but Well, the first phase was to build a cooperative. And this is something that Teresa said, and I found myself in your speaking. Because the first step was to consolidate the collective, and which takes time and takes strength. You have a lot of women who, take, who took the leadership with the support of the Fortaleza City Hall, this woman you can see here. So the collective decision, systematic collective decisions and the rejection of the housing donation. The women wanted jobs. So we decided to build this building with uh, bricks 
fundo da Carnaúba que está and, and this roof here with the plants that you can see and this was essential for the building of to give a positive response of jobs and then housing. So it was a very big change. It be, we began with the production of bricks, men and women. And we were inspired by the technology of this time of low cost technology. Another element was key to unify the community to reinforce the homeless movement and the the Hondon Popular Council was this moment here, which was the 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 community community drawing of the prototypes. So we had a construction workers and some others that rejected our model, a and then we had to redo it, but it was good to strengthen this union of families in a common project, a collective project. And here we have a typical image of how the, the collective work happened. Men and women that worked about 16 hours a week and with more specialized work. And you see the one with the, the the twig doing the adjustments and the task force were men and women who naturally began to work differently in um, beyond the, the gender perspectives. So this was just part of our ambition. Our real ambition was to produce parts of city in a collective way, not only housing. And this was the main point for us. And that it will explain the whole collective land property. It wasn't just housing. Housing was a step for something else. This is the, the community in second phase. You can see the houses especially. And then in the center, you see a daycare. And this is what the families wanted. We're talking about a situation of extreme poverty. The children were locked inside the house when the women wanted to try to find work. And at the time, we had 120 children that were stolen and sold in this neighborhood. So it was a very specific situation, a daycare, a small commercial center, commerce center, um, and a small study center that never really came to be. But you see the gathering of elements, of important elements to not only produce, but also to have a relationship with the rest of the neighborhood for it not to be a separate part of it. And here you can see the daycare. You'll see the small uh, commercial center with stores. But what's most, most important here that I believe is, is that these buildings, the building of these, the tools was also part of this tax force. So they would build their houses and 15, 20% of the work more was to build this well, the common well-being. So it wasn't only for the housing, which eventually becomes an individual uh, thing, but you have something that goes beyond housing, but to build communities. And it was something that was very much discussed with the movement that, that up to this point, brought good results. As Tassila said very well before, before we have a text that we co-produced that will bring light to some elements, but I wanted to bring the legal part related to the land. This one actor and we have registrado em cartório other projects that had their own legal dynamics but this one's the first one 
that was legally registered. It was a land that was donated. And it was for people that had, had the most needs and we had a list of priorities. And we selected 50 families and some of them left. So we had hundreds, we chose hundreds to get the 50. The, the land that was given for a collective property. And I believe it, it feeds on this beautiful work that you have been doing the CLTs. Well, it's been 35 years, so it's a good source to see the mistakes that we made and that I cannot, I do not have time to tell you about all of the mistakes we made, but we could go deeper in another moment. Then we have the second element, inspired also by the cooperative movement in, from Uruguay and its expansion in Latin America, which was the source that we would go for for a very long time, which was the contract of Rio use session, the, the contract of session of Rio use right, which you worked relatively well in its beginning. And the only thing the person had to do to have this term of, of ownership was to have at hand 10% of the construction material, which was the equivalent at the time to $80. We, we, have a, and we had an inflation of three, 4,000 at the time. Um, Então, sumas muito so, pequeninhas, mas que obrigava a construir which um was fundo a small sum, but was something that people need to create a community fund entrar no to help those families that couldn't get into the program Casa Melhor, which was a program to, for the improvement of housing. So, sorry to interrupt, just because your time is up. This is the last one, and if you have any questions, Mas tudo bem. Isto era at os the dois end. Com isto, eh, and this was the two tools, and that's how I end, and I leave the other people to speak. Thank you very much for the invitation. The older ones here, thank you. Thank you for being with us. We're going to have this question and answer moment as well, because I'm sure everybody's curious to know more about Machirão 50 and to bring back these memories. So now we're going to go over to the next moment of our life, which is listen about our, our residents and what's their point of view about the CLTs. And having that, we're going to start to start listening Mario and Lucy. Mario is an executive director of Fidei Comissio de la Tierra, my Campanha, from Puerto Rico. And he is a resident of one of those communities. Livia has also talked about some experiences and Mario is going to talk about that. And Lucy is also a resident of the community. Mario and Lucy, thank you for being here. You have the floor. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to share with you a presentation. I know that we have a very short time and we're trying to be very uh, brief and sum up the most we can. Not sure if you can see it. Can you? Well, we're going to talk about the Caño Martin Peño and its social transformation and also the Fideicomiso de la Tierra, which 
our G8 communities. Well, we have to recognize that Puerto Rico is a land that has uh, been from the U.S. since 1898. It has more than 8,000 square kilometers, kilometers. We speak Spanish and we, our currency is the U.S. dollar. This is the the place in in red that is at the community of the uh, the Channel Martin Pena. We are part of a, a a very big place and it's on the east. So here we see how it happens, this occupation process. Since the, the, the last century, it has happened. Many, many occupations have happened. It is migration from the field to the cities in more urban areas that were connected mostly to climate changes and also, the economic recession in the in 1930s, which has made uh, about the, the population to has to look for other places to live. And in the 40s, there was another process and it has also started the enactment of different laws. And as you can see here in this picture is one of the, of the pictures of the, the, the informal arrangements that they have and different ways that they have to, to move on the communities. And these are two maps of in the decade, in the 30s, and how it has worked in the first one, as you can see, there is a, a channel and there are a lot of places that have been occupied. And on the left, you can see the flooding issues that they have been living and facing on it uh, whenever it rains not only about the climate, but also because of the structure that they have. There was a, a huge flood because of, of some technical issues. So now we can see a picture that that is about the eight communities that have got, got, got together. the migrants have have had to change and move because of the ch the channel each one of these communities have uh, uh, when they get together they make an assembly and each one of the these communities and their residents choose which is the person who is going to participate to the, the g8 and these new residents and members are going to have this assembly and that starts the board. And that happens every year where the leaders, which are young people and all, uh, adults, they, they talk and they exchange some ideas. Nobody has, uh, has anything paid. It's totally volunteered and everyone who's there in these pictures are committed to the improvements of their, their communities. Here you can see some plannings and their participatory uh, actions. It's, it's all about the permanence of their communities. 
um, it's all about the decision making. We uh, sometimes we include children to and that varies actually to every community. We have people from different parts of the world and we invite them to see these experiences. Any guests that come here are going to be guided by these groups because this is very important for us. We also have members of the, the board, just like the Fideicomiso de Terra. We have some meetings as well. We follow a plan of uh, development of the Martin Peña channel. That's a decision that uh, the participants have taken, have a decision that they have made. And that was a lot of demand. They needed um, community centered. Uh, we want a court, a sports court. So every community would have the right to decide which was their their need in each one of the areas. So here you can see that in 2004, 2004 there were many meetings and assemblies where they could present the their bylaws and uh, and all the laws that would be presented by the residents and and that would work with all the the full development plan and that would work and in, in how to approach all these plans there was some reticencies when whenever they would do it and so there was the, the but then the organization of the G8 would see and uh, manage all the the, the their deeds in these pictures we can see part of the of the projects that have been developed, especially about structure, the dredge of the channel, and everything in the context of the Fide Comiso, since they have been working on this land. And here we can see different activities that they have worked on, such as uh, the public gardener, people who have been learning how to read and because many of the adults there didn't know how to read or write and the kids they would help with that so we created this project we worked with and with ways to to deal and tackle violence and also with we have also created uh, activities with sports and how it's going to to happen in the buildings and uh, all the, the footprints and what it's going to be taken and needed in order to build them. All the gardenings, uh, school gardenings would be able to help the children to develop their their reasoning and their leaders, which they call the, the, their youth leaders. And they get together every Friday to, to encourage their critical thinking and have this uh, belonging, uh, sense of belonging, and that all this work is going to be on on, uh, on the benefit, benefit of themselves. So here, here we see many projects that have started in 1994 and there was an, an occupation in 2004. I believe there is a problem in, in the 
a, a network, network problem. We're back. So in 2019, we see that there were in the margin, especially we have uh, some spaces that is for the dredging of the channel. And so in this process, there is there is the there is part of this process that is from the from the residents where the residents residents have uh, are 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 sure of the process and that is going to have happen And even if I go to a good house, there's always this difficult process that affects them. So we followed the whole process. Once you buy the structure, we demolish the, the existing structure to sanitize the area. At the same time, the residents take part on the planning process, working with the conception of what is going to be their new home. And though we have more or less a model, as we can see in the pictures, in the pictures below, well, the Fideicomiso de la Tierra is a private entity without a lucrative means and it's the tools that community chooses the benefits the either individual and they acquire knowledge and they they can get an individual and a collective title so the fideicomiso de la teatro has the same attributes as an individual title so the creation of the Fideicomiso is forever, and the mission is to manage lands that are mostly occupied by families, but also empty lots that will allow the development of new housing. So the Fideicomiso, with the Fideicomiso, they become land owners based on the law 489. The lands in the district were, were transferred so that the corporation could transfer to the Fideicomiso so they could manage it. So they are lands, land lots in the north of the channel and the south of the channel where you didn't have land titles so they occupy these lands this lots i'm sorry and they become part of this collectivity so they are structures that are acquired because the, its institutional uses ended by law of access these structures go to the fideicomiso each family is individual owner of their surface right through the, the scripture in which it, we recognize that they are owners of the building and they have the right of, to occupy that land. The surface rights cannot, sorry, can be sold by the family, can be mortgaged by the family, can be given to the children. It doesn't stop them from doing what they can do with the individual property rights. So it guarantees that they are not going to be displaced. We know that this area will get valued with the tragedy and the speculative market will try to occupy the land. So the Fideicomiso makes sure that there is no possibility of displacement. The land cannot be sold the family can sell the structure in the moment 
of the selling, we do not sell the land. And this is the process of surface right giving in which we follow the family to the city hall. As you can see, a very happy family in this moment. We have over 141 uh, surface rights given both by interest and by right. As you can see, this, this is one of our community leaders. We also say not Maria, not no one can take away what is ours. So we're talking about empowering that we got each one of us in the development of this process, the love for the land. They've been living there for many years and defending it fiercely. Well, he just went through the process of an individual, right? It becomes a collective right. As you can see, we also have the, the giving back of some structures. These spaces, we gather the closest neighbors and they decide if they want to do some garden or a parking lot. So they have an agreement of temporary use. And so we give life to the spaces and we avoid that other people from invading or losing, putting trash into it. And we give it an interesting use to the spaces. Here we have the renting of properties, the properties that were acquired by the Fideicomiso and we put them to use. Many people are interested and as we cannot demolish them, um, we rent them. And that brings some income because we don't, we receive land, we don't receive money. So we need to find ways to grow economically so we can continue developing our land. We have a project that is called uh, Worthy Roof, which are people who have their houses, part of the land of the but they don't have the resources to put a roof or something else. So we could create this program with the young people taking part of this process to improve the quality of life of the people who live there. We also have projects for the elderly. And we noticed that there were many uh, activities for the young people. And now we developed a project to introduce the elderly into the technological uh, tools, cell phones. And since we everything is online now, this is a way of including this population into society. As I mentioned, the Fideicomiso as community activities for the members, not everyone that lives in the community is part of the Fideicomiso. Those who have their individual titles can keep it that way if they want to. Because the Fideicomiso is a collective title. If someone wants to move their family, it is possible in the Fideicomiso. And my home is safe with the Fideicomiso. When the surface right document is given, we also give them this plaque in which the family is proud to put in their doors. 
una permanencia, unas garantías de que no van a ser Making sure of their belonging of belonging to the fideicomiso, which ensures the families the permanence and the guarantee that they will not be displaced by the market strength or by the speculative uh, markets. We are in a privileged zone next to the, the financial center of Puerto Rico, in which the land have very high economical value. So the decision of the community was always right in my perspective. It's been 20 years and our effort have been validated the right to the land, the rights to permanence. They have been legitimized by this tool of the Fideicomiso. We encourage the families to evaluate the possibility of using this tool. We, we appreciate the opportunity to be part of this event and we are available for any questions. Mario and Lucy, muchas gracias, Mario and Lucy. Uh, thank you, Mario and Lucy. I'm sure you could have spoken a lot more time and it's a pleasure to li listen to you and bring this model to, to Brazil as well. And we're going to speak a bit more on that, on the questions, but now we're going to talk about, uh, talk with, uh, we're going to listen Maria da Pinha Macedo. She's a resident of Vila Autodromo, co-founder of the Evictions Museum, committed to the struggle for the for the Kenya communities. And it's great to have you here with us, Maria de Peña. She's, we, she is very well known by us at, on our event. So Maria de Peña, you have the floor. Well, good afternoon, right? Do you listen to me? Yes, we can listen to you well. Good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you and I would like to to thank your invitation and it's great to to be part of this which is great and that gives the gives us the opportunity to meet other people who have the more who have them the same goals uh, that of that uh, we have i come from the villa autodromo community and it has started in by some fishermen and it 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 is on the emergence of uh, the Jacarapagua uh, lake in Rio and it has founded in the the 60s and, and at, the, at the beginning of the, uh, the 70s so it's a great community to live it's well articulate and for so many years it has uh, suffering some threats of ev eviction and we have been resisting since 1992 the first attempt was in 1992 and after that we have res we have been resisting and searching for uh, associations with social movements and a way that we could be uh, could be in the territory in the land and we believe that it's a great uh, subject in this agenda through so many uh, uh, discussions and now we have some some concessions that we can live in the this land we we had the first situation that we lived that was my Meu Pé do Chão, which is a title from the government of Leonel Brizola. And in 1997, we had another concession. We have always had this threat of eviction. But after the Pan American Games, we had also another threat of, of uh, eviction and we resisted once again and we we had another enacted uh, another law of 70 in the 74 
and we were able to resist. But even though we didn't have our, of our rights respected by our governments, and later we had more, uh, more threats because of the World Cup. Uh, I'll try to be very, very brief here, but I would like to, to, to give all the, uh, all the highlights of our history, because I believe that we have our importance. But unfortunately, the city hall is not being is not respecting our story and our space. In 2014, there was the Olympic Games and the community wasn't able to resist again. It is removed and evicted almost the whole part of it. And almost 400 families were evicted. We even we weren't able to have to be there. There was so much pressure and it's a very, uh, very hard fight uh, and discussion because many people can't understand how hard it is in there's they have a kind of a cookie cutter answer to that they come very strongly to us and they oppress the families and our communities keeps uh, uh, keeps uh, struggling and fighting for this. And in the process, there's also the a museum, which is, and because of that, we would like to to understand and the community has been trying to understand about the culture and and all the tools that we have in order to keep fighting for uh, our rights we also have a lot of support from many universities from the uh, favela sustentável and we have a lot of visibility from other other organizations and that that has been helping us to to stay in our in in the lens which is very hard it's a it's very hard to talk about and i believe that if we did have the CLTs before, I believe that we would be able to grant that territory and that land because this, what it is, the, the CLT for us, I believe that it's, it's hope. It gives us hope. And I believe that it gives us hope to have those bylaws to be implemented and to be enacted. And I believe that they, we have the right to dignity and housing. And I believe that this is so essential. So the CLT is hope for the communities in Rio and in Brazil. And also, why not in the world? Because what we are living nowadays and listening, everything I hear from people, it, just, it is so important, this collectivity and the unity of union of the residents so that we understand the importance of their land and, to, and also the importance to be a leader because to work on the on a collective group, it's hard. We know it has its hardships. And I believe that that's why we need to be unified and and together we need to to listen to the community and respect everyone and it's it's fine if anybody doesn't want to come in and to be part of it and i believe that everybody if you are listened if you can be part of this work and you can also be part of your own land
So this is very important, I believe, that this is a tool that has a great potential to improve and strengthen every family's struggles and, and, and favelas too. So it's very rewarding to be part of this process. And I really hope that is, it is implement, implemented in my, in my community. So I believe that we are going to be able to work on that. And I would like to congratulate everyone and who from the CLTs who has been helping and strengthening all the struggles that these people and here in the city. Uh, it's great to see other communities and that have been working in their ways. So this is all I have to say. Thank you very much to listen to me to be. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this and congratulations everyone. Thank you very much, Maria. We thank you for your, uh, your, for you being here with us. And we only have some minutes so that we can uh, understand and listen to all the questions that you have, so that everyone know we have uh, Brazilian people who are being, who are watching us on YouTube. We have many questions on YouTube and we also have some foreign people who have been watching us on Zoom through a translation. It has been translated in Spanish and English. So let me go through very quickly through these questions and invite our speakers to have a very, a very short uh, uh, talking and about that. And I would like for our support group and Juan and Ives also to to be here into our our uh, our gallery here. Livia unfortunately needed to go to, to leave, but we have Mario and Lucy and everybody who could talk a bit more about the Fideicomiss de la Tierra. So the first question we have is about how to prevent speculation, considering that the CLT allows the people sell the, the their places, their their lands. How can they avoid speculation? Second question is how the CLT can work with the parallel uh, powers such as the traffic and the and and the police and also the organized crime. Another question we had, actually so many questions and of possible partnerships of or organic uh, gardening and different uh, or, or different ways of sewage and uh, ways of that, that is sustainable. We also have a question that is directly to Juan asking what are the strategies that are developed by the cooperatives in the market speculation? And people also want to know a, a bit more about the Quilombola properties and also some differences of the surface rights and the concession of use. And Eva also asked about how the CLT model could help the Carioca communities and how it could change the game uh, when compared to other groups that are also concerned about the, the housings and the land. So very, we only have one minute here through the, the question. So talking about the speculation, remember that in the CLT, the people can sell their houses, but this selling usually has some rules that are, uh, have some guidelines by the, created by the, the residents there. And we have many possibilities. For example, you can have a kind of a, um, a, 
a limitation of pricing. You can limit about the people. For example, they need to be under the line of poverty or uh, so there are some formats of limitations to that are settled by the residents in a way that they can face the the market speculation and about militia in Rio since we are working with the communities in order to implement and establish the CLT we haven't faced directly this challenge since even though we have worked with some communities and that have had some hardships but we can as we see that when we strengthen our community it is a key point to any territorial control so that strengthens the mobilization and all the uh, the mobilizing and of the community and it has less uh, less chances of uh, these these groups coming to to them and and we they have been able to resist the militia even though there is some kind of control into the community apart apart that it has also been with uh, also has been work have been working on ways in in order to have some alleys uh, so that the residents have are able to elect these people and also to have some legal organizations in order to work for them so that they they the people are not uh, coerced so we do have some possibilities here about the quilombola properties well there is this kind of a discussion we this regimen is also uh, very similar to what what they have in the clt but it's a bit more restrictive it's according to the brazilian cons Constitu constitution is a bit different. It doesn't restrict to the uses, but also the way that it is able to be recognized. So there are many Quilombola and Caesaras communities that sometimes don't have this kind of reckoning from the government and the CLT does. So it, it really does have some uh, some uh, communication and uh, and also so that might be an issue and the next is about the about giving the surface rights so that implies that the property also keeps for the state and Maria de Peng also has said that they did have the concession of their lands and their rights of uses and they were evicted anyways and because of that right uh, surface rights that grants that this is from the land so that any uh, kind of pol uh, any political movement um, even it if, even if it changes so that that means that it does it, they're not gonna lose their territories so now we're going to talk to our speakers and so that they can discuss about these questions and give their final considerations since we have uh, run out our time a bit. So Teresa, if you want to talk about, I'm going to talk very briefly because you have answered uh, very well about that. So uh, I'd like to to talk about the parallel uh, militia or uh, the trafficking because they are that happens into informal territories so in we know that they they take they use it for their own advantage and even because that's that's why it, it because it isn't in the informality and 
we know that historically there are some areas that are are kept very poor on purpose in order to have a, a, a uh, uh, in, in order to remove and evict people, displace them more easily. And that actually, it's considered as a crime. It is, I think it's good to be, to make it clear that there is crime. And it's, it's great to, it's, so there is this tendency of formalization to create different obstacles of the parallel forces. When uh, about the quilombos, uh, Tarsila has talked about it, and there is also uh, something that is important to think about that it is good to think, uh, I have also posted a video on that, about this, the history of the silti that it has on some countries in Israel and India, some traditions that they they are connected to the land. Thinking about the climate situation, the CLT of Puerto Rico can talk about about this because they face climate situations so they can tell us about how or no how through the clt how do they react to it or not but in general we the clt allows a bigger power of bargain with the state and the organizations and it's not a small piece of land, but it's a big piece of land that they are organized and that brings more response from the public power. So I think that's it. Someone asked if we also work with cities, something that we thought something about our methodology is that we we work deeply locally, but we are always open to dialogue and we have interest. We are interested in exchanging experiences with other cities and learning together. So feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Teresa Juan. So I'm going to focus on the three questions that I can actually speak about. First of all, can you please remind me the one that was asked to me specifically? Um, sure. What are the strategies developed by the cooperatives to in facing the the real estate speculation? So, the strategy is the creation of the cooperation cooperative, this community management, because the market works, and I think that's going to apply to everything. We can see how things are working for the past 40, 50 years. We see a, an ideological colonization of the idea that you solve your own problems, the individual idea. But when you are in a collective, and then you have someone who's always stronger, and if you put one person against the other, the strong one wins. So the first strategy is to recognize the fragility of your own individual position and recognize the strength of your collective organization. It is hard because when you organize yourself collectively, you need to reach deals. It is an enriching experience. It's an important experience, but this is the first step because you, you build in face of this crazy strength of the, the speculative market, you bring the strength of the of numbers and even more important, organized numbers, specifically prepare to resist this. So the creation of these organizations themselves are the first strategy. And then each one of them it will depend on the situation. I cannot say, oh, this place is like this and another place is different. On the Quilombos, and I am a representative here in 
Ubatubo, in which we have four Quilombo territories and two indigenous lands. So we have four um, tribes. But as Estacilo Falo, Estacilo said, I'm sorry, these territories are recognized as collective properties, even more restrictive even. So the CLT will appear in places where the recognizing, the geographical recognizing is made difficult for whatever reasons. For example, for the Caisada communities, it is more complicated because we have many territories where we have a mix of people who are part of the traditional community and the ones that are not. So it's a bit of a challenge for these communities to develop these rights. In the individual rights, we need to understand that the person has their own will. And how do you separate the land property to the surface right? And you have the idea of a big parking lot. And it's collective and you have your car, your bus without wheels that will not leave. Um, and you can sell that building, but you, the place where it is cannot be sold. And why do we do this? Because the biggest value is the value of the land, not the value of the building. Your building loses value, but the one that gains value is the land. So when you separate, you take away another uh, interest issue for the speculation. And what I want to direct um, a little bit is the importance of the formation of any collective tool fight this individualist uh, ideal. Here we're talking about the right to housing, but in, the, in building these collective fights, there is no formula, there is no recipe. The CLT is new today, but it's been happening for a very long time. We have the experiences from our Mexican friends comes from the 20s. So the, the experiences change, they change names, but they represent something. They have this history of how it works and we feed from each experience and each place has a different reality. So it's important to, one of the most important parts about the CLT is its flexibility to adapt to different places because no reality is the same ever. So you need to have something that allows this flexibility in which each organization, each cooperative has the ability which the regulation by law cannot do. It cannot be flexible because it needs to apply to everybody. When you reduce it and you decentralize it and the ability of people to interact with the management of their own collective space, this is the greatest strategy. Thank you, Juan. Yves, can you hear me? Yes, okay. I'm gonna speak. First, continuing the conversation about the matter of the speculation. I'm going to separate the, the theme of speculation into two themes. One is the proportion of people who sell, and another is the price of the selling. So I think they are, they are two themes that need to be separated. With the Multidão 50 experience, it is in an environment of task forces, of mutual help, uh, of a city in Brazil. So you, you have 54 community societies representing 9,000 families, 9,000 households. So when we did the task force, we did a map, a systematic map of the whole land. And what we found is the number of houses that were sold was immensely inferior. So we need to understand why we have four houses that were sold. And 
used to be like 25, 30, considering the poverty. So it began the process of the speculation. How do we separate them? So we have the, the elements, the strength of the community, betting on the community, reinforcing it, and self building and mutual help was incredible in the appropriation. Another element was the collective property itself. Because they knew and the families they would they would go to other places and they would say we could never have this. And ours it was a different element. So it was completely different. So this is a theme in the speculation and, and reselling of buildings. And the other theme is the price of the selling. And as Tassilo said, there are many mechanisms. But what I learned with the CLTs in the States is and what I think is an extraordinary thing that actually works is the one who the ones who who take part in a CLT do not sell. And if they sell the land that was worth 100 and it's worth 300 now, they can only get 120 and the rest goes to the CLT. So the limiting of the price of the selling makes it more successful. So I believe that this rule that is part of the CLT, which is anti-speculation, is very important. And also the laws that are not very well applied to Brazil, but public policies of inclusion that 25% of the community needs to be accessible. So we need to not only work in the program, but go to the public policies so this was the first element that I wanted to bring back. And the other is I wanted to talk about the climate situation. I have seen recently in an event, which is very interesting in Indonesia, that when they have, as soon as they had the, the cyclone and this, the, the, the tsunami, they attacked the fishermen who were able to to be there on the next to to the sea to to fish it's only the one there were only the ones who have united to to work and to buy a piece of land there so that's evidently that there are some ways of clts and any other programs that you you might name it and it's important to see that and also some uh, you we see that this is part of fruit of, of many studies and these studies have shown that when there is some speculative market uh, market to pri to make it private usually there are the people who who are not uh, valued and and that i believe that in brazil it would be very interesting and we could talk about that later uh, in another opportunity that even though that the, they don't have this kind of uh, they, they can't sell that. So let's see, uh, to have this parallel of Brazil and Mexico, it's very interesting. Thank you, Yves. Mario and Lucy, please. In in the community's case, there are some so programs and among those some projects areas that have been following up with the families and trying to find ways to reduce uh, reduce the uh, speculation of market. Of course, the families can rent and sell the, the houses and the but we always try to talk 
to the families in our regulations, we try to understand and try to talk to them because if the family is going to sell that, the FIDE Commission needs to have uh, the kind of uh, aware of what has been selling. So in a way, we do need to have this kind of stock to for the the ch uh, our children or anyone who is trying to get in and needs a house in the parameters in and also low cost and there is another point that uh, we another topic that we'd like to highlight which is uh, something that ha we have talked before we have seen uh, some go governments that have been neoliberal that tried to to dismantle the FIDE Commission for everything that it represents. And that is because of only because it, it is a collective uh, tenure and not an individual one. So we always stand for our FIDE Commission and, and against individual because it's way easier to to dismantle and evict people individually uh, than as a group. So the, the CLT has a great meaning for us because it has, um, it hinders the pol politis, politics of neoliberal uh, policies, as you can see here, uh, as you can see in Puerto, uh, Puerto Rico and the market, speculative market as well, and all the government management, we want them to have uh, respect for for us and for the, the CLT as well, and try to face that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, this is mute, I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I think all the questions were well answered, but I would like to highlight and add that it's great to have the community that they have the political awareness and they need to be in the community because there might have not lots of tools, but if the community doesn't have awareness that it has to, to fight for it, uh, sometimes they will not grant the, our rights because this is all about awareness and also to to have this union which is great in our community i this is why i am what i am living now what i have been experiencing in my community and i also see the possibility in the clts that it's a public that, that there is a better public politics policy here that we can work with the city halls and also grants us some power and understanding for us. I think this is a better tool to fight for our cause. And I would also like to remind that, that the land was not made to be sold, but the speculation market has been taken over and we have been trying to to fight for it and also to have also to be to say no to all the evictions and displacements thank you very much and congratulations to you all who has been participating to this live and thank you for this opportunity and uh, it's great to listen uh, more about uh, what you have uh, what you have living and we can share ex our experiences. Thank you. Thank you everyone, all the participants, Teresa, Juan, Ives, Mario, Lisi Peña, Ives, who, and everyone who has, who have been listening to us, uh, to our video in this life. And in order to wrap it up, I would like to remind you guys that in our website, uh, ttc.org.com 
uh, we don't all don't only talk about our experience here in here in Rio, but in other places too. But this uh, meeting is also placed in on YouTube as well. And any question you might have, you can talk to us. And don't forget our community matters that Teresa talked to us before. If you search for us at Teja Nostra Press you're going to see the information about how, how to get the book, how to order it, and don't try uh, try to read that because it's a really good book uh, to talk and to be aware. Thank you very much. Have a great day, and I hope we can keep in touch and see you. Bye-bye.